Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Thousands of people across the country are asking the federal government to intervene in Alberta's plan to expand coal mining in the province. First Nations who live around the proposed mine have voiced their concerns about environmental impacts. Mr. Mayor Pimentel reports some community members say they are hopeful after a nationwide petition against coal was tabled in the House of Commons. These Canadians are urging the Environment Minister to ensure that there is a fulsome assessment of the impacts of all proposed coal developments and exploration activities in the Rocky Mountains. Over 18,000 people signed a petition that stands for treaty rights and the duty to consult First Nations when it comes to coal mining. NDP MP Heather McPherson presented the petition in the House of Commons. It was launched by Latasha Calf Robe of the Nitsitipi Water Protectors. The petition asked the federal government to intervene in Alberta's attempt to expand coal mining. The petition is definitely a tool to bring public awareness and to really show that there is a collective need to protect treaty rights species at risk, the water. Calf Robe is a member of the Kainai Nation, which runs along the eastern slope of the Rockies. It's one of many communities in Treaty 7 that could see environmental impacts from proposed developments like the Grassy Mountain Coal Project. Until the federal government does such a study on behalf of the over 18,000 Canadians who have signed this petition, I urge the minister and this government to delay a decision regarding the proposed Grassy Mountain Coal Project. Calf Rope says she's seeing support from Indigenous and non-Indigenous people across the country. Seeing people stand in solidarity for the protection of First Nations rights, um, you know, as well as species at risk, water, all that stuff, like it, it really was a, a great experience to see that collective that collectiveness and that solidarity. McPherson has been working with Nitsitipi water protectors to bring the petition to Ottawa. I would be hopeful that people don't let this go down lightly. Um, the mountains are sacred to many um, and many people make this place their home now and call this place home in Treaty 7. This is a good way of restoring those treaty, those treaty relations. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. Last week, NDP MP Charlie Angus called it a big win. That was the decision by Crown Indigenous Relations to hold an independent review of documents regarding the St. Anne's Residential School. They detailed the sexual and physical abuse of survivors, but they'd been denied to them for their use as evidence for the purpose of litigation. Today, during question period, Angus had changed his tune he confronted Minister Carolyn Bennett for continuing to deny justice for survivors. After years of obstruction, the Minister of Crown and Indigenous Affairs finally agreed to an independent review of the abuse of the rights of the St. Anne's Residential School survivors, but she made no effort to talk to the survivors, and now we know why. Because the Minister is arbitrarily excluding many of the survivors, she's refusing to let the survivors know if their claims were breached by the government's actions, and she's refusing to provide access to the evidence that her officials suppressed. This minister has already spent over $3 million fighting these survivors. When is she going to end these toxic legal games and just do what is right by the survivors of St. Anne's Residential School? Do the right thing. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the mistreatment of Indigenous children, including those who attended St. Anne's Res Indian Residential School, is a tragic and shameful part of Canada's history. To restore the confidence, rebuild trust, and maintain the integrity of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, Canada has approached the court to request an independent third-party review of the Sinan's Indian Residential School independent assessment process claims, which were decided without the benefit of Canada's 2015 updated persons of interest reports. Throughout any review, Canada will fund health support measures for the survivors. And on the same day, the House's Indigenous Peoples Committee met to discuss the proposed UNDRIP legislation. Montreal announced its city charter will be changed. It will now include an endorsement of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and an acknowledgement of systemic racism. Two concepts the province of Quebec continues to reject. Montreal Mayor Valerie Plante calls it another step on the path to reconciliation. 
to the West Coast now. An event was held in Vancouver to raise awareness about a young woman who vanished last fall while out for a night on the town with her sister. APTN's Tina House has more. Over 200 supporters joined the family of missing 25-year-old Chelsea Poorman and shut down this downtown Vancouver intersection where she was last seen on September the 6th, 2020, just after midnight. So I raise my hands to all of you. Today we will walk in vigil. It's not a protest today. We're walking in prayer, praying for our sister to come home. We'll see him. Chelsea's mother, Sheila Poorman, spoke at the event. We don't want her, her to be forgotten. We want her name to be remembered. We want her face, you know, to be remembered. Somebody knows something out there. Somebody knows where my daughter is. This is the last selfie that Chelsea took with her sister Paige the night she went missing, when the girls decided to go out on Granville Street. They ended up going to Paige's friend's condo nearby after going to a bar. Paige says her sister left without saying anything. I called Chelsea to see where she went, and then she didn't really tell me. She didn't tell me anything. I called her again, and then the last conversation I had with her around 1 o'clock, she said that she was with a new babe, and she didn't tell me where. That was the last time anyone heard from her. It's been a grueling seven months for the family, wondering what happened to her. I'm not having any answers, and we've had an overwhelming, um, you know, support from everyone. We're going to be walking after this. This special event was organized by Lorelai Williams, who along with her Butterflies and Spirit dance troupe that features JB the First Lady, performed their song, Where Is My Sister? I'm looking for my sister. Where did she go? Where did she go? Why? I want to walk the highways. I want to walk the alleys and the streets. I want to walk the whole damn world. I want to walk. The family led the way down Granville Street, passing by six bus stops that featured Chelsea Poorman's missing poster on digital screens that illuminate at night. Then, a candlelight vigil was held at Victory Square. For Chelsea's mom, she was emotional seeing all the support. If you do know any information, if you do know where Chelsea is, I just ask you to come forward, to phone the tip line, you can be anonymous. We just need her home. We need her home with us. The family has raised $10,000 as a reward for any information leading to the whereabouts of Chelsea Poorman. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. It is a scathing report into the shooting death of Colton Bushy. The RCMP Civilian Review and Complaints Commission found officers discriminated against his mother and allowed evidence to be destroyed after Gerald Stanley was arrested in his killing. Bushy family lawyer Eleanor Sunchild joins us now to react to the Watchdog's report. Eleanor, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, can you tell us a bit about what these findings mean to the Bushy family? They mean uh, some recognition of what they've been saying since the night Colton was killed. They've been talking since that moment about how unfairly the process was how Debbie uh, felt discriminated against right from the start. So it's, it's some recognition of that. It's not complete, but it's a start. In your opinion, do they go far enough? No, they don't. If, if they don't go far enough, I'm, I'm happy with the report what it, that it's, it starts to talk about racism and discrimination within the police force. At least there is a recognition that an Indigenous woman was harmed and that was recognized by the CRCC. But there really needs to be a full um, look into the systemic racism in the entire justice system, uh, not just the RCMP, but this is a start. Eleanor, how do you uh Hope, I guess, uh, do you hope this report will help create changes to the justice system? I hope so. I think it's shaking them up. Um, 
their silence is speaking uh, volumes. So I think that, that they're noticing. I mean, the New York Times reported this. The Washington Post reported this. So people are watching. Again, this has been on the world stage since the acquittal. Mm -hmm. So people are watching what's happening. And I hope that the RCMP is ta and the government, the federal government, is making a, some sort of um, plan to address, address the racism within the legal system. Eleanor, we'll have to leave it there, but really appreciate you taking some time for us. Okay, thank you. Time now for a quick break. Still to come, a new way to reunite parents and children caught up in the child welfare system. Welcome back. A new transition center has opened in Winnipeg with the goal of reuniting parents and children involved with the child welfare system. Earlier this month, Manitoba's child and youth advocate released a report outlining the need for more wraparound services for families upon reunification. As Brittany Hobson shows us, McCoon Transition is aiming to do just that. And since opening their doors in September, they've already seen success. For the past month, Patrick has been living in this West End apartment. But this is more than just a home for the 27-year-old. It's a place where he can rebuild his life with his two young daughters. Patrick is staying at McCoon Transition Inc., a Winnipeg-based assisted living facility for First Nations families involved with the child welfare system. I've always had to do it on my own, and I've always done it on my own. But finally, it feels good to have somebody to lean on. Patrick is not his real name. Because he has involvement with child and family services, he cannot be identified. The young father has spent the past year trying to gain custody of his daughters after he says they were apprehended from their mother. His lawyer reached out to McCoon to ask for assistance. Two weeks after arriving, his daughters joined him. Since moving in, Patrick says the support has been life-changing. They're always there. They do wellness checks. They... You know, they, they bought me a coffee maker the other day and that made my whole day. And I was having a bad day and, you know, just little things like that that keep me going. Patrick's family is one of dozens of families who have moved into McCoon since they opened their doors last fall. Parents and their children move into the facility prior to or after they have been reunited. The facility is home to 19 private apartments as well as support spaces and programs. Kendra Inglis is a Métis frontline worker and the director of the facility. So the phones literally blew up and like the people that were calling it was like it was completely overwhelming because the whole purpose and the point was to do it small and do it right. So I thought we would start with opening eight, eight units so that we could wrap around and give all the supports that they needed and um, like by, by September 10th the whole building was full. Inglis has spent decades working in the child welfare industry. McCoon has been in development since 2017. Inglis originally wanted to build a facility to help youth aging out of care. But through her work in reunification, she found parents were often dealing with similar issues. The same program that I wanted to deliver to youth was so relevant to families that were working within the reunification or prevention uh, they were working to keep their kids at home. And to me, uh, a lot of the families that I was working with in different roles were also kids that had aged out of care. And um, they were just ill-equipped to be able to navigate the world. McCoon aims to offer 24-hour wraparound services for families to make sure they have aftercare support when their kids come home. It's about giving the power back to the parents and letting them choose what they think they need. You know, and, and I feel like they, they take so much more from the programming when it's their choice to be there. Samantha is another single parent living with her children at McCoon. She recognized she needed help after getting two of her kids back in December and asked to move into McCoon. Immediately when I got here, I felt like the support, like people coming to my door knocking and asking, like, are you okay? 
do you need any help today? You know, like, what is your plans today? Those are things that every mom, like, getting their children back really need because sometimes we aren't okay. Samantha feels she is in a much better place than she was only a couple months ago. This is where I always wanted to get, you know, get my kids back and just thrive after that. This is the best part for Inglis, watching parents do the work and leave McCoon better than when they came in. Parenting isn't easy. It really does take a village and we want to create that village here and then create it for when they transition out. Brittany Hobson, APTN National News, Winnipeg. What a great service. Now to a story rep reported this week on APTN's Nouvelle Nationale. A family of Inu hunters in Quebec is drawing fire for posting a social media video. It's demonstrating a traditional method of finishing off an injured caribou. Here's the story from Shushan Bacon, read by Lindsay Richardson, with a warning some may find the images disturbing. Here's a glimpse of the video posted by the Lalo family during one of their caribou hunts. The video itself is prompting discussion on social media, and much of the feedback so far has been negative. Daniel Lalo is a resident of Natashkwan, an Inu community 1,000 kilometers northeast of Quebec City. He says the goal of the video was to educate youth about finishing off an injured caribou and that this method is used by most Inu hunters because it keeps the head preserved for later use. Lalo says a kill shot was lodged in the beast's shoulder before dealing his final blows. Quand j'étais jeune, moi, j'ai suivi tout le temps les, les, les aînés, tu sais, euh, les aînés, ils disaient tout le temps, là, quand l'animal est blessé, il ne faut pas le tuer, il faut, il faut que tu le fasses avec la, pour l'achever avec un hache. Social media commentators, however, were not just angered by the methods used. The post garnered reaction from residents of Labrador who feel the woodland caribou shouldn't be hunted because the population is dwindling. Lalo says they called a total of 36. Nous autres, on est conscient là, que le troupeau, le, le caribou, il est en voie de disparition, mais. Depuis uh, X années que nos, uh, nos conseils de vente ou uh, les gouvernements, les groupes à des gouvernements, soit le Québec ou la, la, uh, le gouvernement intervient ou uh, du Canada, tu sais, on, on, était, on a eu tout le temps des rencontres, puis on a, ça n'a jamais rien abouti dans ce rencontre-là. Riel Teto, chief of Natashkwan, says he'll be introducing a new caribou management plan for the community. He feels Lalo's video shows a lack of respect for the animal. Tous les gens, les aînés, nous autres, ont été en désaccord la manière qui a été faite. C'est pas la, la, la mode traditionnelle. Many feel the debate about hunting etiquette or how to handle an injured animal requires additional discussion. For his part, Lalo hopes future debates won't end in death threats. A report by Shishan Bacon, APTN National News, Wendogue, Quebec. Time for a quick break, but stick around. There's more to come. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. As spring has officially arrived, Sarah sent us a picture of her daughter taken while out on a walk along the Red River in Winnipeg. And for the chance to be our next photo of the day, you can send your photo to share at aptn.ca and make sure to tune in every night to see if it's here. Well, hopefully spring weather is here to stay. Let's take a look now at tomorrow's weather. Starting on the east coast, plus 7 in St. John's, 15 for Halifax. Minus 14 in Kujuak, 21 below in Inukshuak. Plus 9 for Shibugamu, 13 with showers in Valdor. 8 with rain in Sault Ste. Marie, 11 with showers for North Bay. A rain snow mix and 7 for Thunder Bay, minus 2 with snow for Sioux Lookout. 19 below in Churchill, minus 9 in God's Lake. Plus 1 with snow in Winnipeg, 0 in Dauphin. 7 above for Regina, 6 in Saskatoon. Plus two with snow in Meadow Lake, minus seven with snow in La Ronge. 
over in northern Alberta, minus 5 in high level with snow, minus 4 with snow for Fort McMurray, 10 above in Medicine Hat, plus 5 with snow for Edmonton. 9 with showers in Vancouver, 10 with rain for Kamloops, 5 in showers in Prince George, 3 with snow in Dease Lake, minus 10 in Old Crow, 4 below for Whitehorse, minus 14 in Yellowknife, minus 12 for Norman Wells, 21 below in Saks Harbor, 18 below for Politak, minus 27 in Chesterfield and Whale Cove, 23 below in Arviat, minus 27 in Resolute, Arctic Bay and Joe Haven. Craft Hockeyville Canada has announced its top four communities and a First Nation from Atlantic Canada has made it to the final round. First prize is $250,000 for arena upgrades and a chance to host an NHL preseason game. Elsie Puktuk is the largest Mi'kmaq nation in New Brunswick and hockey is a way of life that was lost when their recreation center burnt down last September. The community hopes to win Craft Hockeyville to repair the arena and get the youth back on the ice. The public can vote online April 9th and 10th with the winner being announced during the first intermission on April 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Retired NHL player Everett Santa Pass and his niece Kylie Francis said the community came together to enter the contest. You know, like our youth are our key. Like our youth is what we want to see achieve great things in our community. So it's just the fact that our community is being heard, and yeah. so yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm just a great uh, supporter uh, for the for for the team, <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and I hope that uh, Canada. Uh, hears us and, and then supports us. And we wish the community well. Ontario NDP MP for Kuwaitanong Saul Mamakwa was recently accused by Premier Doug Ford of jumping the queue to get his COVID-19 vaccine. The Premier has since apologized, but on tonight's episode of Face to Face, Mamakwa says the accusation is an example of what racism looks like in 2021. His stereotypes about me as a First Nations person, that's what it looks like as a, you know, uh, racism looks like in 2021. And uh, to try to put me in a place, I mean, like uh, one of the comments that he made is that, that, I don't, that I don't belong in that community. And that it's really uh, evident that, you know, he's trying to control uh, where I should be, control where as a First Nations person, where I should be, where I belong. And you can catch our entire interview with Saul Mamakwa in less than two minutes' time. That is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. And tune in tomorrow for In Focus, live at 3 p.m. Eastern. They'll be taking a look at the new $65 million Inuit Art Center in Winnipeg. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night.